My name is Russell Brown. I'm uh, uh, teaching this class. I'm the education coordinator for Plan Check NC. Plan Check NC is actually a, a group that is a collective of all the neighborhood councils and folks in the city that are interested on planning issues. We meet the second uh, Saturday of each month downtown and uh, work through a whole bunch of different planning issues. Uh, my background is I'm a 10-year resident of downtown. Got involved just like you guys, just a neighborhood guy who sort of showed up. And before that, I was living in the Hollywood Hills. And I remember one day somebody was coming to my mailbox and they had this postcard. It was like, are you interested in getting involved in the neighborhood? There's a brand new group called Neighborhood Councils. They hadn't even sort of really started yet. It was in formation. And I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to sort of get involved. And uh, when I got involved in the Hollywood Hills area, we're basically in the district that's now called Hollywood United Neighborhood Council. Um, Griffith Park Observatory to the Hollywood Bowl, um, Hollywood Boulevard to the Hollywood side. So Hollywood has five different neighborhood councils. And four of them, other than East Hollywood, pretty much revolve around the intersection of Hollywood and Vine. We felt that that was the center and then they radiate from there. So I went to this meeting and folks were from homeowners associations, local businesses, all different kinds of groups. And they were their main commitment was they wanted to get involved in the community and start doing some things. And I realized fairly quickly that the two groups, um, which were more than a year in the organizational process, had a lot of really good people. But one group represented half the community, and the other group represented the other half of the community. It was actually called um, Franklin Hills, uh, neighborhood Association and Hollywood Alliance, and they hated each other. Um, they hated each other, and they couldn't come together. And literally, it was, as I went to the meeting, they said, would you like to get involved? And my very first meeting was a mandatory arbitration, forced mediation with people yelling and screaming and standing on chairs and throwing things. So Jim remembers those days. We, uh, one, of the, one of the women who was involved in it, very passionate, um, very focused on her opinion is the way of doing it, had a local newspaper, had done a really good job of organizing a lot of folks and sort of leaving a good number of folks out. And then the other group was just as bad in, in a different way. We went to be certified literally in a meeting that I think three neighborhood councils were there. There were 500, 600 people. It was almost like yelling and screaming and protest and banners. And in the end, the neighborhood council board of commissioners said, thank you for all your work. We're not going to certify. You're not going to certify either group. You've done an amazing, amazing job of, of work, but you only represent half the community. And we will not certify a group that can't bring everybody together. We really felt like you got a phone call and your parents had died. And out of that, there was sort of silence for a month or two. And then a group of us, and fortunately I had come in late in the process, so I sort of wasn't really tainted or affiliated with one side or the other. And myself, um, another woman who happened, Susan Swan, who happens to be president of Hollywood uh, United Neighborhood Council, and that's where the name ended up coming from, Hollywood United neighborhood council to bring us together. Plus the acronym of HUNK sort of seemed <laughs> sort of interesting. But we sort of worked together and we had a lot of tension of the renters versus the folks in the hills. The downtown Hollywood business versus HPOC. You know, the old sleepy historic neighborhood and the new skyscrapers. And at the time, you know, it's 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 a little bit difficult to remember, but there was a time twenty years ago Hollywood wasn't very great. Wasn't very great at all. And so there were, I, I remember one time driving my car at Hollywood in Western, which was sort of the worst of the worst downtown. And suddenly I see three guys out of the corner that are like jumping over the back of a bench and one guy is shot, falling in the street as two other people are like going after it. And it was like, what, what have I moved into? So fast forward, you see all the changes that have gone on in Hollywood. So 10 years ago, I moved downtown in a neighborhood that was just as ragtag as what we were doing in Hollywood. If I told you with no money 
and no expertise, you could create an event that changes the whole face of your neighborhood in your city and brings 30,000 people each month, would you feel that that was a good success? That's what we did with the art ball. If I told you that you could get involved with the city and design the regional connector, the subway stations, the light rail stations, a streetcar, and make it happen and build enthusiastic consensus with no money and no experience, that's what we've done. If I told you that you could take the freeway going through downtown and envision a billion dollar park on top of it, a neighborhood park on Spring Street, and, and taking back Pershing Square and having free movies and free concerts and the best farmer's market in downtown, again, with no previous experience, you don't know anybody, and you do it with no money. That's sort of what we did. So when, as we go through these issues, if you feel like you're not sort of prepared or educated or you've never done this before, don't worry. Because if you are smart, but more importantly, if you show up at the meetings and want to get involved, you'll be one of very, very, very few people in the community that get involved, and you can start creating that vision. So what we're going to do today is hopefully give you the basic structure of who are the partners, what are the resources, how do you make this happen, and then sort of move forward. Um, who, has, who feels that they have just a really basic, barely elementary uh, knowledge of planning issues and sort of a, a vision for the community? Okay, so just a few people. Um, who feels that they're, you know, they're not a land use consultant, but they have a pretty good knowledge, but more importantly, they have a willingness to show up at meetings and read and get involved and get informed? Okay, that's most people here. And who are the professionals who do this full time? Good, nobody. So, okay. Um, one of the best ways to figure this out is really to go to the city of LA's planning site. And if you just spend 10 minutes browsing that, you'll be amazed how many resources are there. The, um, I, I had one guy attend a meeting and he was out in the valley. And he said, nobody ever comes to our neighborhood council, especially planning meetings. But all we're hearing is we have a lot of development coming in, but we don't know how to handle it, and it's just more of the same ugliness from the past. So you start working with, with groups, especially the city, where you sit down and say, what are the rules and regulations that we can do to make this look attractive? You know, how is the design of the building done? How is the landscaping done? What is the parking? Is what is presently in the neighborhood, does it even meet the standards? You know, a lot of people don't know that there's landscaping standards. Are those being enforced? There's setback, there's signage. You know, so you start to figure out what are the parts of the community that you know you can change, and then start to work with that. Well, um, we were fortunate that when I moved downtown, 10 years ago, we were just starting to build a residential community. We've gone from probably 15,000 people 10, 12 years ago to more than 15,000. So 15,000 people 10 years ago was a few apartments in Bunker Hill, the beginning of South Park a little bit, and a lot of affordable housing in Skid Row. So what we've done is we've been, always been very supportive of more affordable housing, but we flipped that balance where you now have mainly adaptive reuse projects and historic buildings and a lot of new construction. And we've been really successful, and it's much easier downtown, when you have an attitude of, we want to say yes, but these are the terms of yes, as opposed to no, 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 no. And that was one of the issues I've seen in Hollywood, where a lot of people have wanted to say no, but they couldn't tell you what they wanted to say yes to. But the bigger part of the issue, like in Hollywood, is when you have a neighborhood that's split with four different groups, you have no coherent vision. And as long as you have no coherent vision and you have nobody um, supporting that, it's going to be really difficult to, to get things going. Um, we've 
And I don't think downtown is any different than most other communities. You know, downtown is not one neighborhood. Downtown is probably 20 neighborhoods. And when you go from one block to the next, it dramatically changes. And that's not any different than most everybody in their own neighborhood. You have, you know, multifamily neighborhoods, you have single family neighborhoods, and you have commercial districts. So don't feel that those can't support each other, because you need all of them, but you need a coherent plan to sort of help them work together. When you go to the city's website, the very first thing you'll see is the general plan. It's the framework, it's sort of the mission of the city to organize. And um, when you look at that, you'll see on the website, it says general plan, and this includes transportation, air quality, um, conservation, housing, noise, open space, safety, transportation, and infrastructure, and public rec recreation. So those are all parts of the general plan that, that you have to go through. Probably one of the easiest ways you can get involved is open space and the planning issues. That's where we've had the most luck downtown. And if you happen to be in a neighborhood with a lot of transportation, you can change the whole face of your neighborhood through the transportation corridors. I think more than anything else, what we're going to be seeing the next 20 or 30 years is how transportation is remaking neighborhoods. So what you can do is you can protect your single family neighborhoods by H o HPOZs, Historic Preservation <coughs> Overlay Zones, if you have them, by community plans, updates, and you have to, all of these things, if you're not in on the ground floor and the foundation, working, changing all this, building this, by the time it gets to the city council, by the time it gets ratified, it's a done deal. Yep. So you have to really get involved at the very beginning. And specific plans is another part of it. Yes, sir? You mentioned open corridors. When I have so it's a big car off right across the yard. How do you make that nicer? Let's get into specific plans for specific neighborhoods sort of at the end. Okay. And to be real honest, I'm not well versed in that particular location. Yeah. Um, we'll go through this and if I don't answer it, we'll come back to it at the end. So there, there's a number of tools. The community plans is one of them, but everybody who knows the city of LA knows that it's it's often like doing cataract surgery on yourself with no anesthesia. So, <laughs> so you just you sort of have to have a high level of tolerance for bureaucracy and realize things move in years sometimes and then suddenly it's like the icebergs they sort of suddenly fall and melt really really quickly so you have to sort of be there um, there's an old saying the harder i practice the luckier i get you know um, I, I remember as part of this we had organized downtown patty berman who's uh, was my partner in law there she was um, she was in charge of the neighborhood parks recreation open space she's she was um, she's now the president of the neighborhood council we had done an inventory of what do we need downtown in the historic downtown, the older part of downtown, Broadway, Spring, and Main, we knew needed green space. And so we had a series of meetings for a couple of years of what are the needs, what are the neighborhoods, what are the locations, and we had sort of decided in historic downtown that a parking lot directly across from where we live was the only thing that was available. The city came to us in late fall, I want to think it was about near Thanksgiving, and they said, Oh, the other part of this was we didn't know how we were going to fund it. And we had known that there was a huge amount of development going on in downtown in Hollywood, and we could not get numbers that said what the equipment fees were. So we actually started working with the council people, got nowhere, with the city, recreation parks, got nowhere, with the city attorney, and then we went to Downtown News, we went to LA Weekly, and if you remember the huge scandal, sort of, where it came open that they said, oh, by the way, we have $110 million, and we have no tracking system and no way to tell you what was going on. That was our neighborhood council with a huge number of partners saying, enough, let's figure this out. And once we realized from the city that they not only couldn't handle it, but more importantly, there was $110 million to work with, you could start doing something. So fast forward, um, you know, months later or years later, we now have this park and recreation open space plan. The city calls an emergency meeting and says, 
we have an opportunity that there's a parking lot a block over between two condo buildings that was entitled for a hotel with condos on top, is available for sale at a really good price. We don't have a system that we can move fast enough to do community outreach, to build consensus, to do the escrow, and go through this whole process. So we need your help. We could sit there with 20 people in the room and say, that whole year outreach process, we have already done, and you were in those meetings. Remember all of those meetings? And we can get you le unanimous letters of support from everybody in the community this evening that we've done two years for the community outreach, and we're ready to go. That commitment not only made the developer feel comfortable, but it made the city feel comfortable. And we now have a park that's taken four or five years that's broken ground, that's moving forward, that's going to be an $8 million park. So that's the, the more you practice, the luckier you get. So if you don't make your vision known to yourself and then sell it to everybody else and build partners, then nobody really listens to you. And everything that we're going to discuss with neighborhood councils is you have to be in the line of conversation and you have to be smart and intelligent about it. And if you're a small group of people who are just saying no, 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 and the city council and everybody else thinks you're not representative of the, of the community, you're not going to get a whole lot done. But if you get to the point that you do the work, you show up, you work with all your partners, and there's a very big difference between disagreeing with people and being personal and nasty and just being sort of crazy. You know, I mean, if we look at politics right now, you know, you can disagree, but somewhere along the line, line theoretically, we're supposed to work together to get anything accomplished. So when it comes to transportation issues, planning issues, open space issues, you know, having people listen to you, it's all the same. Form a group that's smart, intelligent, and representative, and we will be there. So this, you start with this general plan, the general framework, which sort of gives all the rules and regulations and principles of the city. And then the next phase is the city is broken into sort of 35 um, really, really, really big neighborhoods, like Hollywood, you know, or different neighborhoods. And those are the community plans. And those community plans theoretically go through a revision about every 10 years. In reality, many of them are very old. Hollywood just got renewed and it was, what, 30 years old? Uh, 88. 88. 88. 12. 35. So, um, so 35 years old, and it took five years, I think, to go through it. But that community plan becomes the basis of what sort of the zoning vision is. You'll have commercial corridors, you'll have historic districts, you have monuments, you, you have your transportation linkage, and it should theoretically be an up-to-date sort of list of all the assets in the communities and all the needs of the community. And, you know, my personal opinion is figure out the areas that you want to change and you want to develop and, you know, come up with a realistic plan of what, what decent development looks like. I'm not talking about where are the doors and what, what's the flowers and the trees and what's the color of the buildings. But, you know, if you have a historic district, what are the assets of that that you want to preserve? You know, like Little Tokyo or Olivera Street are historic districts that have a certain character to them. Larchmont Village has a certain character to it. What are the elements of that that you want to preserve? And realize not everything, most things should not be stuck as a museum. Even if you go to, you know, Europe, you go to Paris, you go to London, I mean, it's a historic city, but it also has a vibrancy and energy and brand new buildings. It was considered, um, you know, blasphemy that the Louvre Museum was being renovated with a glass pyramid in the center, you know, an IMP design. And if you, if you looked at it from the standpoint of a static museum, that should never be changed and should be stuck in the 1600s? Yeah, it's very different. If you actually go to the Louvre Museum, it's not only beautiful, but more importantly, when you look at the underlying structure, 
they had a 1600 castle that was, was rambling all over. They had tens of millions of people a year coming with bus and fumes and no lunchroom, no ticket take. It was just all this garbage going on. And so they came up with a master plan of let's, let's excavate two stories down. We will connect all the buildings, but more importantly, we'll have shuttle buses, we'll have transportation, we'll have um, drop off, we'll have ticketing, we'll have cafeteria, we'll have gift shops, and we can hide all of that underground, connect all the buildings, and the only thing you will see on the top is this glass pyramid that lets light in, but more importantly becomes this amazing piece of sculpture that sort of shows its way to the future. So in many ways, that's what you got to do with your neighborhood. You know, what are the parts that really work? And I think all of us will say having parking lots and freeways and big box shopping centers just get bigger and bigger and bigger and parking lots become, you know, 14 football fields and you go to the Costco. That's not a neighborhood that you want to be in, but more importantly, it's not a neighborhood that makes your soul sort of say, I really love being here. So there's ways of doing it that you can change things around. And that's what you got to do in your community. So when it comes time for the community plan updates, it's a lot, a lot of work. But if you get involved in that, you really start to have a say of how you change it. And realize you're not going to get what you want a thousand percent of your time. You know, if you get what you want sort of 75 to 80 percent of the time, I think you're doing pretty good. But uh, I remember we had presentations for the Grand Avenue related project. This was the Frank Geary design, billion, $3 billion project that's supposed to happen across from Disney Concert Hall. It went to an international competition. They had like five different groups. That was narrowed to three different groups. They picked one. And then the teams actually picked people off the teams that lost to sort of come together and form a vision. And it's a really tricky site across from Disney Concert Hall because you have that Tinker Toy garage and it cascades down the hill and there's you know a bunch of buildings and it's all spread out and Disney Concert Hall is this amazing asset that is squeezed in a lot that's too small and then you have the music center across the street and these really ugly LA County buildings that didn't have any vision and then you just have a hole in the ground that's been there for like 20 years and these big parking lots so and it takes a lot of chutzpah for us to do this but we knew the neighborhood really, really well. And related group, international, billion dollar plus company, um, did Time Warner Center in New York and all these other places, very knowledgeable. Worked with Frank Geary and others to develop a project. The only portal to it was right across the street from Disney Concert Hall. And the other three sides was parking garage, flat walls, you know, just really ugly. And we said no. And, and the original design, if you know Frank Gehry, he can be brilliant. He can also be very, very much out there. The original design looked like the favelas of Brazil cascading down the hill with the towers of the oligarch sort of rising through the first part of this. And that was, that was a context in an urban environment that I don't think you really you know, we want to talk about the 1% versus the 99%. So it was all these boxes that were painted sort of really, really bright neon Latin American col uh, colors with this glass too. But more importantly, the three sites that you entered from all of downtown were blocked off. So we started working with them and said, no, this is about a plaza, this is a whole neighborhood. What if we did gateways and portals and you got five stories that cascade down, what about those become restaurants and those become shops and a grocery store? And so eventually they came back and they reworked all of this. And, and I remember the architect saying, you made us understand how we have 100,000 square feet of rentable space that we thought was a dead zone and just parking lots. And it starts to integrate all back into the community. So those, are, and, and this was a whole team effort. The LAPD headquarters across the street, we fought with the city for five years. I mean, that was going to be a park. And then when it was the LAPD headquarters, it was literally a walled compound that closed off the whole rest of the city. And we said no. 
And we, you, we sort of played with their ego, too, and said, you know, with the LAPD, do you really want to be in this, you know, military compound that's low rise, that the city hall has all the power, would you rather sort of be a partner? And so they created sort of a monument to balance out the city hall. But more importantly, when they did the opening and Chief Bratton was there, he said, I know that we fought with the community on a lot of this. I want to thank the community for forcing us to change our attitude and more importantly, build a building that opens to the whole community because that's now our mission. Community policing and being partners with the neighborhood. And we've created that in a building that now shows that change of attitude. If you go to LAPD headquarters, there's a park behind it. That was purposeful because originally that was going to be a park in that whole section. We didn't get the huge civic park there, but we got a $60 million park from the halls of City Hall to the Music Center. Partly because we built consensus downtown that having that open space was something everybody would, would appreciate, enforce, and want it. And it allowed them, you know, you don't get what you want here, but it changes the conversation that now you can start to get it someplace else. And you may be able to get it in a bigger way than you even imagined before. So, so when you look at these issues of, you know, I didn't win on this, but you set core principles, I think you can start to change the whole conversations in other different ways. So you have the general plan, you have the community plan, and in certain neighborhoods they have a specific plan. And the specific plan is much more detailed, like Beechwood Canyon, the upper part of the Hollywood Hills, near the Hollywood sign, has a specific plan. There's also what's called HPOZs, Historic Preservation Overlay Zones. Those are usually very intact historic districts, and you can have a wide range of, of styles in a historic district. And Hancock Park has one, and that doesn't mean that every single house is historic, but it means the neighborhood has a unique character that you want to preserve. And there's, there's rules and regulations that, that come with that to protect the neighborhood, but there's also restrictions, and that's a part of the balancing act. So as you create that vision, you know, realize that there's trade-offs, but if it's a free-for-all, you know, who wants a, a beautiful Victorian house next to, you know, a, a used car repair shop next to a recycling center? And that's what we see in a lot of neighborhoods. When you go through the planning website, it gives you all these tools and it'll get into a lot more detail. Um, the general plan, I think, is like 300 pages. You know, it's listed there. It's, it's not easy reading and it's not something that you want to memorize. The zoning code is just the same. It's, it's this technical encyclopedia of stuff. But it's actually organized in a way, and with the internet and websites, you can go there, you can Google search what you need, and in five seconds it comes up. You know, if you need to know uh, what are the rules and regulations for parking in your neighborhood, you know, what are the different districts, you can find that. And they have an amazing resource on the planning website where you can click in neighborhoods and they have all these maps. And the maps tell you on individual properties and individual neighborhoods, what's the zoning, what's, are there restrictions. It's called Zemus. And you can start to look up all of that. So if you go on the, on the site, and you'll see these little tabs on the side, and your whole neighborhood is divided in a map. Just click on your map, and it'll tell you the rules and regulations. But more importantly, you can click on the tab, and you can actually enter a certain street or an intersection or an address, and all of those things will come up. And you can overlay the maps on top of each other. So when projects come through to you, you can tell when somebody's presenting something. You know, Patty and I and what, 12 others are very involved in our neighborhood council planning meeting. You know, one of the very first things when people come in is, what is by right and what are the variances you're asking? Those community plans, those specific plans, give you the rules and regulations that says, this is what is allowed in the neighborhood. Um, this is the floor height. This is, are there any street standards? Are there open space? What's the parking requirements? What's the zoning code on this? You know, if it's strictly residential, there are certain rules and regulations. Does it allow multi-use uh, residences? You know, does a granny flat in the back um, apply? 
you know, maybe that you're in a single family neighborhood that's all little bungalows, but if somebody buys three of them and combines it into one lot, that suddenly becomes very different kind of zoning. You know, is that appropriate or not appropriate? If across the street is a whole block of buildings that's six stories tall, and you've got two or three little houses there, maybe it's appropriate. If the whole neighborhood is all, you know, historic craftsmen, and somebody wants to build a six-story six stucco box, maybe it's not appropriate. If it's a transition and they're building, you know, these huge developments, but the front is commercial on a busy street and the back is residential, maybe you have designs that are around the corners and the back steps down and creates these transitions. But you start to create that. But the where place you need to start is what is by right, what is allowed, and what are the reasonable variances? And just because it's by right doesn't mean that they can't go outside of the box. They can, but they have to get approval, and that's a variance process. And that variance process is where your negotiation really can come in. You know, start to figure out what's the vision for the neighborhood, what's the benefits you want, and how you work with them. My personal experience is been 90% of the people are very willing to work with rational, coherent, people who have a common vision, who, who can be their head cheerleaders for a great development. And there's always going to be some people who are going to do what they're going to do anyway. It's, it's much, much easier for us downtown when we say, you know, if you brought another 100,000 people down here, we would feel fine with that. But we want wide sidewalks, we want streets that work, we want landscaping, we want parks, we want the streetcar, we want, you know, uh, you to build another uh, light rail station across from the stadium. You know, we want to do it that's, that's appropriate. You know, we want to support the LA River. Those things aren't appropriate, you know, in a suburban model or a, a small residential uh, or retail village model or in an HPOZ or in hillside properties. So you got to figure out, you know, what's the balance. The, there's, on the website, it goes into details to what community plans are, to what specific plans are. But more importantly, I think if you um, use the common sense of what's the existing character of the neighborhood and look at the community plan, especially if it's been updated recently, it's usually color-coded, and it'll tell you, you know, residential, commercial, mixed use. Um, when we have projects come downtown, we always make sure that how it interfaces with the sidewalk both from a pedestrian standpoint, but you know, is there retail? Is there restaurants? Is there outdoor seating? Is there landscaping? You know, you can have a 40-story building, but if it's a blank wall, you know, it's a dead zone. But if you have just a, a neighborhood market or a restaurant and cafe and outdoor seating, you know, suddenly the whole feel of the neighborhood changes. But then we also look at it and say, okay, if you got residents there, what happens at 10 o'clock at night? What happens at midnight? What happens at 2 o'clock in the morning? You know, where's your parking? Where's your loading and unloading? You know, if you're in a neighborhood that has shared parking like downtown, we don't really care that you're building 30 parking spaces, you know, right on the project because there's five parking garages and parking lots all around. But, you know, nobody wants to build a project that they know their customers can't come to. So there's a number of tools for that, whether it's a shared parking zone or traffic mitigation. And a lot of people get all upset when they feel like the rules are flexible, but you have the opportunity to create that flexibility yourself. If it's appropriate for the neighborhood, you know, you can sign off on it. If it's not appropriate, don't sign off on it and work with it. But by the time the project comes to the neighborhood council and it's all finished and the designs have been done and the hearing has been set and it's, you know, on the fast track to go to city council, it's too late. You know, the, the, when you're leaving on that trip to the airport, you know, if you show up 10 minutes after the plane left, I don't care what your intentions or excuse are, that plane's gone. So, uh, and, and folks don't realize that when things come to city council, it's finished. 95% of the time, all the work is done. And what we've done downtown is, and this is a model that I think is appropriate for most other people, the real work gets done in the committees. It's the same for the city council, same for the neighborhood council. You know, somebody in the class right before this said, how do you have neighborhood council meetings that are only two hours? We have five and six hour meetings. 
The way we do that is 95% of the work is done in the committee. We have, what, 12, 14 people on our planning committee. I think it's 14 because we have 27 people on the board. It's now 28. So you can't have more than the quorum of the board on the committee. So we have 13 people on the committee since we had 27 on the board. And um, you, you can't basically ratify a decision in the committee and then that's a majority on the board. So we've been really fortunate that um, everybody in our neighborhood council, even when they're no longer board members, they stay involved in committees. So we actually have more previous board members and ex-board members on our planning committee. Um, and we have a really smart, intelligent group of people with all different backgrounds. We have planning meetings that are three and four hours long. When it, when it goes to the full board, it's a consent calendar. So, and they feel comfortable enough, and it took us years to get to that point, that, that when something goes to our board, and it's a consent item, they know that we've discussed this for three or four hours, and any of the board members can come to the committee meeting. They also understand our rules and regulations and principles that we've sort of set up, so that they have a trust that if we spent four hours in the planning committee and it goes to the board, that they don't have to start from scratch. Otherwise, imagine that four hours planning committee being imposed on the two hour regular neighborhood council meeting with a bunch of folks who have no context, no planning background, no anything else. It, it's a recipe for just gridlock. I saw a question over here. Yeah, so, so if we have a quorum of seven, but you're not, it, it also depends on whether they're board members or non-board members. Huh. So, you know, we used that half of the board as the original part of it, but now that we've got to the point that we have so many non-board members, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but you, I'll use downtown's number, uh, and I'll use an odd number just so it makes it clear, because the, when the city added the at-large position, it actually went from being a 27 to 28. And so 27 means a quorum is 14, right? 13 plus one. So we felt that we couldn't have more than seven board members on the committee, because if those seven went to a full board meeting, that would be the majority of the 14. So, so then we, so we, we limit our committee to seven board members, but we also have a number of non-board members. Are you allowed to, if you know somebody's there, that's the individual rules and regulations of the neighborhood councils. Um, there's nothing uh, in, in the previous session that we talked about. One of the guys actually worked for one of the city council offices, and he was on the neighborhood council. There's nothing that prevents anybody from being involved in the neighborhood council. If you're voting on an issue that you personally financially gain then you need to excuse yourself on that issue. But theoretically, every single person on the neighborhood council has some kind of conflict, because that's why they're a stakeholder. If you didn't have any interest in the whole neighborhood council at all, why would you show up? That doesn't mean that the interest is a personal financial interest. We've had projects that came through our neighborhood council recently, and Patty and I live in a large, um, uh, she's down the hall from me, and there's an apartment building that had some restaurants and shops that were coming in on the ground floor. So when it was presented, you know, we just said, we live in this building, we don't have a financial stake, we want it to be a great neighborhood, but we want to tell you up front, you know, we live in the building and this is going to be a downstairs neighborhood. Nobody said a thing about that, because they, first of all, they all know where we live and, you know, we weren't really hiding anything. But it also put us in the position of anybody later came back and said, wait a minute, you know, this is your downstairs neighbor, you know, why are you voting on this? It's like we disclosed that at the beginning, and that, that works two ways. You know, we want to be in a building, we want to be supportive, but we don't want a, a business downstairs that's a crappy neighbor either. So, yes, ma'am. starting sound it's going to be a long question oh, yeah. and real briefly okay. our board members uh -huh. that 
that live within 500 feet of a development required to excuse it? I don't think so. You know, um, there, there's no, if they're not having a financial interest in it, you know, they're as involved as anybody else. I, I do think that you bring up a good point. Often I see neighborhood councils, and I've seen it in myself, I've seen it in other people. If your personal biases are really influencing your decision, what, what, there's a point where you say, you know, I know this neighborhood really well because it's downstairs. And if you use that as a rational part of the conversation to inform people about the issues, I think that's fine. If you use that as an irrational basis of, I don't care what goes on down there, I'm never, ever, ever going to approve anything because I want to keep the neighborhood exactly the same. And I'd rather see it empty and abandoned and you know screw them. You know, then other people start to realize you've got to be sort of biased. So let's get through the presentation and we'll do some more questions. So just be fair and honest as you're evaluating things and disclose, you know, oh, Jim's presenting this and I used to work for Jim's company. So either trust us or please come to those meetings. And we will even arrange the meetings for our board members to, you know, to make sure everybody comes. When it goes to our neighborhood council, we actually have it as consent items. So there may be four or five different projects. We have letters of support or disapproval that sort of explains what it is. That's part of the packet, and it's a consent item. Any, any board member, for absolutely no reason, can pull an item off consent. If you just, and, and we let them use their discretion. If they just have some technical questions that are really minor information type things, you know, we'll let them ask it. But if they really want to get into a debate, we pull it off the calendar. We vote on the consent, so that's been approved. And then we get into, you know, what is your question? A lot of times they're... Can you give me an example of that? What was the question? Of what a consent calendar is? Yes. Yeah. You pull it off, but I don't understand. Okay, let's say, like this one, we had four different development projects. Right with four letters of either approval or disapproval. We, the planning committee recommendation was, we want to approve the consent calendar and ratify the committee's decisions. Uh, there was one that was a restaurant on Main Street that was an affordable housing unit that the restaurant wanted uh, to have a, a liquor license. Some of the folks didn't really understand that and didn't feel really comfortable without a discussion of approving the liquor license for a restaurant on a street that was adjacent to Skid Row, but more importantly was an affordable housing unit. So we pulled that, they voted for the three, and there was no, really no discussion because they approved it. And then we had lengthy discussion. <laughs> I, I, would, I would actually characterize it as much more animated than discussion about that issue, and that was appropriate. And the board, even when it had gone to committee, we spent two or three hours over a couple of months and had different presentations, didn't approve it the first time, told them they need to come back in and bring other people, bring the owner, tell us, bring the menu. When it, the committee voted to approve it, but it was, there were strong arguments on both sides, and I think most everybody who even approved it didn't really feel that if they didn't get the liquor license, it was the end of the world. And a lot of people felt, since it's brand new, you know, why don't you start with beer and wine? Why don't you start with a lot of restrictions? And oh, by the way, this is somebody we've never met before. They don't really have a history. They don't have a track record. There was a lot of unknowns they're applying for. What are the hours? What are the rules and regulations? You know, what's, what's the zoning? Is it beer and wine? You know, is it a restaurant? Is it a nightclub? And all of those categories have very firm restrictions. You know, a sit-down restaurant with liquor is very different than a bar. A nightclub with live entertainment is very different. So you sort of work through those. You get the planning commission um, agendas, and you can also get all the reports from the city when they're doing new rules and regulations, whether it's signage districts, whether it's um, community plan updates, whether it's murals, um, all that notification comes through. Um, I would also recommend looking your no local newspaper, especially if you have a newspaper like Downtown News is a great resource. 
most communities have little local newspapers that talk about different development projects that are coming through. Um, come to our plan check meeting, which is once every two weeks. Um, every month? Excuse me, once a month on the second Saturday. So uh, it tells you how my mind's working. This was supposed to end at what time? Uh, no. um, we have a couple of questions here. Just have a quick one. Okay. Um, Com here uh, the comments from Dr. Uh, question from Dr. Susan. Community plans don't address how a great number of alcoholic beverages uh, control the department of license. In fact, the community, for example, Big Street and Melrose Avenue in the U.S. City, uh, the neighborhood council area has a great uh, has a great concentration of ABC licenses. There are no guidelines to deal with that call for finding uh, land use. How can we deal with the issue since the ABC department is getting the city? We don't have guidelines as to our business. Uh, that's not true. Your neighborhood council can be as involved on liquor licenses as it wants to. And every CUV can come through your planning committee and you can set up rules and regulations. I, I will admit, and you see this downtown, if you're in a neighborhood that is more uh, a destination point for a lot of bars and restaurants and visitors, you're going to have more than your normal share if you're just a suburban neighborhood out in the middle of nowhere. You know, there, there are rules and regulations that say, and, and I'm making up the number, but it's like normally there's, you know, 30 liquor licenses for, for 20,000 people. You know, we have like 200 downtown, but you can't just go by the residents. You know, you have to look at, we have 500,000 people a day who live or work and come through downtown. We have 50,000 people who live here. So when folks say, well, you're allowed, you know, 20,000, 20 licenses for, and I know the number's not right, for 10,000 people, so you should only have 100 and you have 300. Well, the reality is we really have a catchment area that's 500,000 people a day who already live and work downtown and then a lot of visitors. So you have to figure out what the proper balance is. Um, it's, it's not a, we really make the line not so much with restaurants that have food service, but if it's off-site sales, liquor stores and things that are selling outside that are not grocery stores, not the big chain grocery stores, that's handled very differently. So, the plan check meeting is at uh, downtown on 5th Street between Spring and Main, 114 West 5th Street. Um, we have a space uh, on the ground floor of the Roslyn Hotel. You'll see a big steel metal door. 10 o'clock on Saturday, the agendas are also posted. You can get on our list and we go through all of these issues. There's also agendas up here for our next plan check meeting. Right. As a neighborhood council, can we ask to get a set of projects instead of, well, we get this evaluation to kind of flow There is a lot of impacts happening. Being as a general contractor, when they dig the foundation, they do grading. We don't get all this information. The stuff that the city sends is fairly complete. I'm, I, I'm not an expert enough to know that, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's every, every, everything. Um, I, I, usually, most questions that you would ask if you sit down with the developer, and are you actually looking at the packet that you're getting from the city? Well, we're getting a packet, just uh, floor plan, elevation. Those are doesn't like determine what the impact of the grading is going to be, what our foundation will be, especially like four. Uh, uh, four story building. Well, I, I think the, I'm pretty sure the city is sending out what they're required to send out. You know, uh, if you need more than that, especially if it's a unique situation like Hillside with certain issues, I think it's appropriate to call that developer, call the city, and say, you know, we need a little bit more clarification. You know, uh, I, I would also suggest that so you don't bore everybody. Um, if you've got how many people in the planning committee? and only one or two or three of you are experts on certain things and you know you really want to focus on that, you may want to try to have the developer come in early for the meeting and you just meet sort of one-on-one -on -one and go through that. Because if, uh, if you start focusing an hour on drainage and hillside issues and everybody else is like in over their head or they don't really care, you're going to lose the focus of the group. No, I'm just worried about the impact because you're not going to go to the specifics. It will be very boring, as you mentioned. But as an expert to help the rest of the community, 
Yeah. We need those plans to go up. But I, I think that's the kind of thing that you as a committee would say, okay, when we have hillside issues come in, it needs a different level of review, and I'm willing to sort of work, because I'm an expert on that, to sort of get up to speed on that. Thank you. Just a couple of last questions, and then I can do this individually. So. I have one and a half questions. The half question is, did I understand you correctly to say that the buy the right uh, does not meet the government process? I, I'm not sure what you said on that. Right. Most by right project, projects don't need to go through a whole circuit of community meetings okay. if they're doing it by right. Okay, now, that was my half question. My full the, question. And the city is, is actually trying to change the code with community plan updates and other ordinances to give a, a high degree of certainty of if you do this project within this envelope, we will approve it and you don't have to go through a huge amount of, of approvals in the public process. If you don't do it within that envelope and you're asking for variances, we may have a little bit of discretion, but if you're asking for a lot of changes, it has to go through a public process. And realize um, every fairly large project, regardless, even if it's by right, still usually goes through some kind of community process. And liquor, li and liquor license and adult uses and sort of off-site sales, I think automatically you have to go through a public process. My full question, thank you very much. I have been getting these ENT uh, messages uh, on my email for about three and a half, four years. I learned about something that was happening in my community only when my city councilman's office called me and the deputy said, did you know about it? And I didn't know about it. We didn't get it on the ENTs. How can I, we, it was, it was passed, as you say. You know, so, so, some, sometimes things skip, but what also happens is often the notification can go out and it can have been years ago and realize there's a number of projects that were fully entitled and the city council now passed like a five-year extension because so many of these with the recession went through a huge amount of work and it was approved and then the financial markets fell apart. The, the city has sort of grandfathered those in. So this may have been one of the ones that before the neighborhood council was really active or it was approved a long time ago and now it's still, you know, got an extension of entitlement. I, I would say even in that situation, the market has changed, the neighborhood has changed, financial reality has changed. What also happens a number of times is, is people get entitled for one thing and then they start making a bunch of changes and they're making that at the counter and not in a public process. And so it, 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 if you know this big project is going, is gonna happen and it's not, sort of on the public radar. I would call those folks and call the council office and said, you know, we would we we heard this, you know, six years ago, we hear it's going back through, or we've never had a hearing on this, or we had a hearing on this and this was three years ago and now we have a new board of directors. We'd like you to come in and update us. Thank you. Yeah. One okay, thank you guys, gals. If you have any personal questions I'll be glad to answer them. Yeah. Uh, before you all leave I want to say I left some flyers.